Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to go through kind of a little retrospective on last winter, maybe maybe a little PTSD for some of you, maybe some good memories. I don't know. I For me as a runner, it was more of the former. Um, and then we'll kind of look forward. What are we expecting? We've all heard El Nino is back. So what does that mean uh, going forward? And then I kind of want to talk a little bit about uh, just some of the weather oddities that we can see here in the Tahoe region. We all know about atmospheric rivers and all that jazz. But there's some other little peculiarities that we can see here, and especially for folks that might be new to the area, it's uh, informative. And then I'll finish up with kind of how we're taking weather forecasting kind of to the next step um, with the, within the National Weather Service. So uh, there's my contact info on the email there. Um, you know, take a picture of it, whatever. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions on um, presentation, uh, feel free to email me. That's the best way of getting a hold of me. Um, and as I mentioned, I do run quite a bit. This is actually a picture from just above Incline Village. Um, I was doing a loop from Tahoe Meadows uh, down to Incline and then up to the TRT and then back. And I got slightly lost. And I, but then I came around a corner and I saw this and it was near Third Creek, just incredible waterfall with the fall colors there. It is, un, you know, normally they have fall colors, right? But we don't have a ton of water in the streams during fall colors because it's usually really dry. Well, we had all the moisture that we had this summer was still in the system. And so the creeks and streams were still going pretty good. So that was just, it was fun. It was one of those moments that um, I, I, I will remember for, for a while. So uh, we can go forward here. Oh, see, I'm going to point toward the computer. Oh, there we go. Okay. Is there any interesting weather the next one or two weeks? You could kind of say that. Uh, the word atmospheric river might come up once or twice. What you're looking at here is the probability of seeing atmospheric river conditions at various latitudes along the West Coast out into the future from all of our models. So basically it says what percent of the models indicate an atmospheric river making landfall on the West Coast? Doesn't say anything about intensity or character, warm or cold, whatever. But of course your eyes are drawn to this big blob out here around the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th. So next, you know, middle to end of next week there. And uh, sure enough, uh, there is definitely something in our models, but you notice there's, there's kind of an elongated um, nature to it, heading more into actually into Southern California. And that's actually something we've been seeing with this potential storm for next week is a little bit of a southward um, shift. And so the big question is latitude that this storm is gonna come in at. So let's dive in here for Tahoe City. So what we do now is we use what's called the National Blend of Models. And some of you who you know, are, are kind of weather geeks, you might look at the GFS or the European model or the Canadian. But what we're doing now in the weather service, we're taking every model we can get our hands on. We are essentially the Borg of weather models. We are assimilating all the data. And then we bias correct it, calibrate it, and then we spit out all that information into kind of a best guess format, but also, hey, what are the ranges of possible scenarios that might occur. So what you're seeing here is a graph. Now it's going the other way, unlike the other one. So right now it's there and then it's moving forward in time off here to the right. The, the blue line is kind of our best guess for the rain snow line elevation, which is over here. And then the, the variability is the shading in, uh, in the lighter blue. And then the precipitation, the water equivalent every six hours are these green kind of light shaded blocks with the scale over here, quarter inch in six hours being the, the top of the scale. So of course your eyes are drawn Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, maybe even into potentially Saturday of next week. Very broad period of potential precipitation, but lots of variability in that rain snow line elevation there. Uh, below, here's lake level, 6,200 feet roughly, well below it to well above it. So, ooh, could we get just rain? Could we get a lot of snow or maybe a little bit of both? Or could we just get like nothing? Which all, uh, which is certainly possible, right? And if you lived here long enough, you know, a storm looks amazing on day seven, then you get to like day one, it's like, where'd it go? Uh, we've seen that happen before. All right, so what does this mean for snowfall? Well, here's the box and whisker diagram from all of that data showing you the potential ranges from, uh, there it is, zero, it's certainly possible, to eight inches of snow in 24 hours. There's seven inches the day before on Wednesday, Thursday, eight, and then Friday, about let's say six there. So you know the, the 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 worst case or the best case, depending on your perspective, is on the top line. But there's a tremendous amount of variability there. So I think that's a key uh, point about this potential storm for next week is it is by far not a lock at this point for anything. I mean, it is. It's even surprised us is is how things have shifted. Now let's talk about that. So are we getting the shift? 
with this storm coming up. So here's that same graph that I showed you for Tahoe City. So the very same one, identical. And then this map here shows you the, the jet stream winds um, coming in late next week. And notice, look at this thing. It's just going right into Southern California, which is actually a very much an El Nino style pattern. And uh, now what did this, what did this same pairing of maps look like just 24 hours ago? It looked like this. The storm was coming right into Northern California, separate jet streams, but there was enough energy coming right into Northern California. Top end there, 19 inches in 24 hours at Tahoe City, centered on Thursday. So things have shifted quite a bit. Not in our favor if you like snow, but hey, it is, it is what it is. It is a transition season, and it's called that for a reason. So that's the main uh, topic of interest over the next uh, week or so. Now let's take a look back at our, at our uh, you know, the last say 12 months or so. And thankfully, because of also of our, our big snow winter, but also we haven't had a lot of windy dry days. And when we've had thunderstorms this summer, they've been fairly wet. Uh, we haven't, we've had another quiet fire weather year in the Tahoe region and in, uh, in um, Northern Nevada. And so what you're seeing here is a plot for each NWS office. How many red flag warnings have each NWS offices issued? So Albuquerque and Pueblo, their top right there, 61 red flag warnings at Albuquerque. It's been a very, very uh, volatile summer down in New Mexico. But here in Reno, well, we've only issued five. Now, what I think is an even more striking statistic on that is NWS New Orleans has actually issued more than we have. Uh, Mobile, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi, Lake Charles, Louisiana, Houston, Texas, 10. They've issued double the number of red flag warnings that we have. So it's actually been a very quiet season. Um, and I think, thankfully so. You know, it just, we haven't had those big wind events um, yet. So now how did the, the winter of 2022, 23 rank historically? What you're seeing here is a graph from all the snow tell sensors in the Sierra from the Truckee Tahoe region south through the Walker River Basin from NRCS. And here's 2023. Each of these colors represents a month. So this guy here is December and then January, February, March, and for each of the years. So it's a really nifty diagram just to see the distribution of snowfall per month, but also comparing it from year to year. So 2023, of course, is now the winner, at least since, uh, since 1980, although 2017 is not too far behind there. But the other thing that you can see is look at the interannual variability. You know, we go from feast or famine to feast and back to famine and then back to feast. And that's that generally is pretty normal for California and Nevada climatology. We have large interannual variability in precipitation. But the other thing to notice, too, is we've actually had periods like in the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, also the early 1980s, where we've actually had back to back to back wet periods as well. So that's certainly on the uh, on the table as well, either of those potential scenarios, either just another big up and down or potentially something where we, we potentially do have another uh, wet winter. So we're going to dive into the models and, and, and see what they have to say for this coming winter. So let's see here. Let's see. Where are we going? Oh, okay. It's catching up to me. It's catching. I got too much energy here. All right. So last winter. That looking at this map is showing you comparing all the precipitation stats for last winter compared to data back to 1895. And everything in this dark green is record wettest. So it eclipses even 2017. So it's like it's like Interstate 80 or Highway, maybe actually more accurately, Highway 50 is now the new atmospheric river corridor. That's a, they, should, they should change it from the loneliest road in America to the atmospheric river highway. That's what it should be called now. So there, so record wettest. But actually, what's amazing is wet as it was here in Tahoe, it actually was wetter than normal further south you go, down toward Mammoth. Uh, we did a lot of briefings for the town of Mammoth Lakes because of snow load issues. They were having so much snow, it was crushing structures and propane tanks. And uh, it, was, it was a very serious situation that, uh, down there last winter. So here's some stats for Tahoe City. We have one of the best uh, cooperative observers in the Weather Service maintains our official station here in Tahoe City. The stats go back to the early 1900s. So we were 15th out of 114 years uh, and 143% normal in terms of the precipitation between um, October through the end of September. So that's the water year. We do things a little differently called the water year. 
You go from October through the following September, so it encompasses the, the winter. What's interesting is Reno, we actually ranked the second wettest water year in over 100 years of record, and we were darn close to hitting the actual all-time high. Uh, we just needed one well-placed thunderstorm. That would have done the deal, but we didn't quite get it. Um, we were kind of forecasters. We we're just like, man, we're so close. Let's just do it. Let's get it done. And we just, the atmosphere just wouldn't cooperate. But what's interesting is here, Tahoe City, we're not that far away, right? Line of sight. Here, we're 15th here, but Reno was second. Why is that? You know why? It, it, it seems pretty different. Well, that's because a lot of the storms that we had last winter were very efficient spillover storms. There wasn't much of a rain shadow. Any, and and we're, we're noticing that more and more with the storms, especially the big atmospheric rivers, is they're not producing that big rain shadow and thankfully not as much wind, which I'll take that deal. Um, but they're producing a lot more precipitation in the lee side areas that typically are a little bit uh, drier in nature. And that, while this, this kind of gets outside of my lane professionally, that is something the climate models have shown is that the Great Basin on the lee side does would trend wetter over the coming decades. So maybe that is a signal of that, is, is not as much of a, a rain shadow as what we're accustomed to. Um, also, uh, well above normal on the number of days that we got measurable precipitation here in Tahoe City. Now, for me personally, as wet as it was, the thing that stuck out about last winter was how cold it was. Um, anybody who lives down in Reno, you know, NV Energy, our utility, our, our bill at our house was just like every month, I'm like dreading getting that email how much is my natural gas bill going to be this month? And we don't even have that big of a house. And it was it was substantial. So you can see large areas of well below normal, uh, you know, top 10% in terms of colder than normal there uh, across a good chunk of the West. And we haven't had a winter like that in some time. So some stats for Tahoe City, uh, you know, in terms of when you put all this together, lots of snow, eighth most amount of snowfall, 26, more than a marathon's worth of snow. So I like to put it there. So on... Um, we had 64 days with measurable snowfall that ranks second. So the number of days that you woke up to more snow on the ground, that was the second most uh, number of those days that we've had in over a hundred years of record. Uh, also the ninth coldest water year. And I think this is a stat that's pretty striking too. We've had 27 days in Tahoe city last water year or last winter that stayed totally below freezing which is unusual. Uh, normally you don't see that many days. And actually the last time it was, we had that many days that were totally below freezing was 1956. So it's been a long time since the region was this, uh, this cold. And you see similar stats down in, in, in Reno as, as well. So you put all that together, lots of snow, no surprise. All right, so let's look back at the seasonal outlook going into last winter. What did we know and when in terms of were we about to have this major you know, historic winter? Well, what you're going to see here, this is a very crude analysis of what the observations ended up at. It was very cold in the western U.S., very warm in the eastern U.S. I think I remember, I think it was March. March was the month where I honestly, as a meteorologist, I dreaded waking up every morning and looking at what the models had. Because I'm like, I swear, if there is one more atmospheric river pointed our direction, I'm just, I'm done. Um, and I was like, I didn't want to look at that AR chart, you know? And, and so that was the winter, that, that was the month that kind of put things over the edge for me. But at the same time, in the East Coast of the US, my folks live outside of Washington, DC. In the East Coast, I think Hartford, Connecticut was in the upper 90s in March already. So it's, uh, it, it, and they're related, you know, when the jet stream, dips in the west we get storms but then it curves upward in the east and so they get all the warm air so not surprising there but and then here's the precipitation analysis of course above normal across where we live a little bit drier than normal in the pacific northwest now what did the forecast say and this is just one month lead time okay not too far um not quite really picking up on that now is it so it actually indicated a drier than normal condition in the southwest wet in the pacific northwest had really no clue in the uh, where where we live there. Had very almost, I mean, it still had colder than normal Pacific Northwest, but really didn't have the clue that it was going to be as cold as it was. So this is the way of putting seasonal forecasts. So when somebody tells you what's coming, you know, months in advance. Seasonal forecasts, they're too good to ignore, but they're not good enough to use. So how's that? There you go. Um, 
another way to put these forecasts, they are making advances, but they're really where day-to-day -day weather forecasts were about 30 years ago. So if you think back to you know forecasts then, how accurate, how reliable were they? Would you make a decision based on them? You know, that kind of that kind of thing. But that all being said, let's let's focus on the too good to ignore part as we as we go forward. Um this, this winter's big driver, El Nino, is back in the Pacific, and it's a big one. We're already well above normal in the tropical Pacific. This is the El Nino region here. Waters in the North Pacific, unrelated to El Nino, also very much above normal. And so going forward, um, you know, we actually could rival some of the strongest warm anomalies on record since 1950. In fact, there's about a one in three chance we actually get close to a record warm anomaly in, um, in the El Nino region of the Pacific. And that's why you're seeing a lot of headlines about how warm the planet is, is a lot of it is driven by El Nino. It, it, it kind of ups you know, the, the, the warmth in both the ocean and the, the nearby atmosphere as well. So what do people, you know, you go on, the, you do the man on the street thing, right? And you say, hey, what does El Nino mean to you? Uh, well, number one, if you, you've been around long enough, Chris Farley, remember that one? Yeah, the, the, the Nino, all other tropical storms must bow before El Nino. So there's that. Um, there's also this, and some of you may remember me for this. There's the wine scale. How much wine should I stock up before the big El Nino storm comes? So honestly, I did. When I first started in the job as, as like a public affairs person, I, I, did, I, I actually had a wine scale that I'd use in briefings. I say, okay, how much should you stock up? And that, that went along nicely for a while, but then our regional headquarters got wind of it. And then they're like, thou shalt not do wine scales. So, but it, you know, it, it is one of those awkward moments where, you know, you're the federal government, you should be sort of polished, but at the same time, it's like, well, you know, this, I think this resonates with some people, you know, it, it resonates with me, right? You know, so, all right. And then of course there's this interstate 80, you know, we, we've all, we've all seen, we've all been there. Yeah. And, all right. Now, what does El Nino really mean? Um, you know, generally, this is it drives the jet stream further south, and so we tend to see more frequent storms in the southwest U.S., Southern California, less frequent storms, a little bit warmer up in the Pacific Northwest. La Nina is effectively the opposite, a little bit wetter in the Pacific Northwest, a little drier in the uh, in in the southwest, less frequent storm. Now, of course, you know, here in Tahoe, we're kind of caught in between. The one little thing that I'll say, and again, this gets outside, slightly outside my lane, but it's something as an operational meteorologist I think about, is these textbook definitions of what El Nino and La Nina do have been made over, you know, decades, uh, you know, the, a number of decades ago. The, the ocean's different. Remember that warm anomaly I showed you in the northern Pacific Ocean? That's, that normally isn't there. And, and that's something we've seen over the, year, over the recent years. And the, it's the temperature gradient between the warm tropics and the cooler mid-latitude oceans that drive where this jet stream goes. Well, when you have both have these big warm anomalies, that gradient isn't as pronounced. And so it makes the jet stream position less certain. It wobbles around more. It locks into position more, which we've seen. We've seen, remember these storm patterns, like once it starts storming, it doesn't stop for like two or three weeks at a time. So that's something that we're seeing as operational meteorologists, and I think is, would be a good research question. Do these textbook definitions of El Nino, are they in La Nina, do they really pertain as much as they, as they used to maybe 20, 30 years ago? All right, that being said, let's look at what the models have for this coming winter. What you're gonna see here are the seasonal outlook models that actually just dropped yesterday. So we're looking at some pretty fresh data here. Uh, wet anomalies in the greens and blues, dry anomalies in the browns and oranges. And uh, you might not be able to see it because they're a little bit, little bit uh, kind of smooth, but generally near normal, slightly wet, super wet. Oh my, look at that one. Um, wet, super wet. Uh, near normal, we'll call that near normal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have not tripped on that yet, but I will. All right, call, I'm calling it now. Uh, drier than normal and basically near normal. So only one of them actually shows a drier than normal outcome. So statistically, that's an interesting, uh, interesting fact there. So that, that data alone would lean us in the wetter than normal direction for our region. So what have past strong El Nino done? This is a scatter plot looking at, this is Northwestern Nevada and then the Northern part of California, including the Tahoe region here, uh, comparing precipitation in October through March, 
with uh, the El Nino and La Nina conditions here. El Nino's in red, La Nina's in blue, the ones in between, the neutrals in green. And so the El Nino's, if you just look at them as a whole, pretty much a perfect scatter there. Um, but if you just look at the strongest ones, the most anomalous El Nino's, the warmest ones, like the one we're having, they're there. Hmm. That kind of tilts in the at or above normal category for both. So it's only three data points. So any scientist is going to tell you, ooh, it's only three data points. But hey, it's three notable data points, that's for sure. And, and so that, that kind of potentially tilts us in that, in, that, uh, in that direction. So another little thing is looking statistically at snowfall. This is a map uh, looking at snowfall anomalies with moderate to strong El Ninos. And you look at now Texas and New Mexico, they're done. They're, they're annihilated. They're going to be under feet of snow this winter. Yeah, so I, I started the weather service in Midland, Texas, West Texas out here. The highest thing out there were the overpasses, flat as a pancake. But they're going to they're gonna have a big snow winter. Pretty high confidence there based on that map. But here in Tahoe, it might be a little hard to see. We're right on the edge of the blue shading. So that kind of hints, oh, maybe, maybe we do have a little snowier than normal winter uh, possible. This is some data from Donner Summit from the Central Sierra Snow Lab. This is actually as of 2015. This is when we were going into the, remember the Godzilla El Nino that we had in 2015 that ended up really not doing a whole lot? So again, back to that, is that textbook definition of El Nino really as, as relevant as it used to be? But look at these. We actually had a number of winners that ended up on the you know, pretty potent category in terms of snowfall for, for Donner Pass. But then again, we also had a couple that were below normal as well. So it just goes to the variability there, but it keeps the door open to either a, a snowy winter again or maybe a not so snowy winter. All right. Now flooding potential, I think this is all, always on our minds. Um, generally what you're looking at here are looking at the, uh, the stream flows on the major river systems. What the peaks were during uh, flood events and when did they occur? Did they occur in La Nina winters in blue or did they occur in El Nino winters in red? Well, here in the Tahoe Truckee River region, generally it's the weak La Ninas that get us. That's what we were going into last winter. So that's why we were in like full on panic mode come New Year's Eve when we had that big atmospheric river coming at us. And we were like, oh my, you know, this could, this could, this is setting the stage. We had the snowfall, we had the wet ground. And the third thing was I had approved leave for my hydrologist to be off that week. So you know darn well, that's when it's going to flood. And I told Tim, I said, I'm not giving you leave between Christmas and New Year's again. That's, that's when we get floods in Reno. And um, so sure enough, we came really close, but the rain snow line just dropped a little bit. And we ended up getting just heavy, wet snow down in Reno instead of a flood. So again, I think most of us would take, uh, would take that trade. So generally, the, it's the weak La Ninas we have to worry about. Now, of course, it's, it's still not a, a zero chance of, of, seeing, of seeing flooding this winter, especially uh, given what we had last year. So what's the best guess? There you go. That's your best guess from me. Um, that's me given one of my, one of my, you know, um, what was he? Uh, I'm, I, I forget, I forget who said this, but I'm a pro, professional. Look it up in the book. So uh, you got your eight ball, you got your rotary dial phone, feet up on the desk, you know, it's all good. We keep, we keep it real. But more seriously, what is, what is, if you average all those models together, it does lean in that wetter than normal direction, but it's only the first gradient of green, meaning uh, it's just a slight lean in, uh, in that direction. The official forecast from the Climate Prediction Center for J December, January, February does also lean above normal on precip, but it also leans above normal on temperature. And that one, I'm, I'm less convinced is as robust a signal. I think a lot of that is just long-term climatology that in general, we've been trending warmer than say it was 30 years ago. Uh, I think there's an argument to be said that the variability in the atmosphere could definitely bring us some cool periods, uh, cooler than normal periods this, this winter. Now, is it going to be as cold as last winter? I hope not. Yep, I hope not. I'm right there with you. I'm done with that, uh, especially as a runner. I'm like, uh, enough of that. Um, another way to look at it as a pie chart format on precipitation is you're basically, you add it up and you're looking at about almost a four in five chance of at or above normal on the precip, maybe a one in five chance of a, of a drier than normal winter. So, uh, you know, if you're over in, in Reno, you're at the craps table rolling dice, the dice are slightly loaded toward a wetter than normal roll, but you could still potentially roll a drier and average average winter. That's, the, that's probably the best way of, of looking at these seasonal outlooks. It's our best guess. So the bottom line is uh, 
let's see, we can definitely still have that, that drier average winter, but we need to be prepared for another wet snowy winter. So in terms of preparing right now, uh, just be ready for that. We have seen these back-to-backs before. Um, you know, October was largely a dry month. October can be a, be a very boom bust month in terms of precipitation here. Uh, November, at least the second half of the month, does have a little bit of a wet signal. So maybe winter starts next week. Maybe we'll see uh, how that how that pans out. Um, you know, the the key point here about flooding is, as I mentioned, we're not in a weak La Nina, but we still can't keep our guard. Uh, we have to keep our guard up for potential flooding because the lakes are fuller, the streams are running more. Uh, the soils are wetter going into this winter than they were last year. So if we do have a significant warm atmospheric river, Pineapple Express, just be mindful of that 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 potential. And uh, you know we're not a big not a big concern right now, but if we end up going back into some prolonged dry and warm stretch, you know fire weather is certainly a possibility. We have seen that in the in the middle of winter, not so much at Tahoe, but in the lower elevations, more into into Nevada and eastern California. All right, so we're going to move along here. Here are some little nuggets, peculiarities of Tahoe weather. And here at Sunnyside, they're no stranger to this. When we get east wind events, it can actually get really rough on the lake. So often what, uh, what comes, you know, we, we always think of, of the winds out of the south, southwest, the, ahead of a storm being really the rough lake days. And, and that certainly can be a possibility as well. But it's when the storm departs, when the cold front comes through, you think everything's done we usually get a period of east winds uh, in the atmosphere behind it, and it comes over the lake and uh, drops down into the lake and creates some really strong, big waves. This is, these are pictures from the, uh, the west shore of Tahoe a few years ago with the strong uh, east wind event, even impacts Mammoth. They had a serious event in 2011, uh, the Devil's Windstorm, as they called it, where Devil's Post Plow saw hundreds of trees come down from a, an east wind event over 150 miles an hour at the, uh, at the summit. These can actually be uh, big wind events for areas like Kirkwood and the ski areas at the top of Alpine and, um, and Palisades can see these events as well. So um, just be mindful of that. When, when you see an east wind direction uh, on the weather report, um, it, can, it can be a little bit of a surprise for, for a lot of folks. All right, moving along, lake effect snow. You know, you think this is just a Cleveland or Chicago thing or a Buffalo thing? No, Lake Tahoe can produce really big amounts of lake effect snow. This is an example from November of 2020 where we had a lake effect snow band develop on the lake and it went south and crossed along into Highway 50 and produced significant amounts of snow as far south as, as Echo Summit. And here you can see a picture from the heavenly camera of that lake effect band. So you go from nothing to like snow squall and like two inch an hour snowfall rates like that. So they're very fine scale, small scale features. These are generated when cold air moves over a relatively warm lake. And so it's that temperature difference that can essentially create a snow thunderstorm and produces these high snowfall rates. We've even seen lightning off of lake effect snow. Uh, Pyramid Lake is another real big lake effect producer. So if you live in Reno or Sparks like myself, that can surprise us as well with, uh, with localized heavy snowfall. Uh, one little thing is a uh, climate change aspect here is that as the lakes warm, and they stay warmer longer, lake effect snow can actually become a more common thing later into the winter. Typically it's an October, November, December thing when the lake is still relatively warm, but we've seen it extend into January and February in the last decade or so. Um, so when you hear lake effect snow, that's what you're looking at, very localized intense band of, of, uh, of heavy snowfall um, there. And what else we got here? Oh, the inside slider. This is mainly for any of you folks that might live down in Reno or commute down to Reno. If you hear the term inside slider, this is our version of the Alberta Clipper. Anybody who lived in the Midwest um, comes out of the north, super cold, little band of snow. Honestly, doesn't do much up here in Tahoe and, and, and Truckee, but it produces a band of snow more into the Great Basin in Nevada. And it is, it is often just an inch, two inches, three inches of snow. And, but it's cold enough that the rain snow line elevations go down into the city and it creates traffic nightmares like this. Um, I love screen capturing uh, Google traffic maps uh, when I'm safely to where I'm going, uh, mind you. I, I, don't, I don't even want to look at them if I'm trying to get home. Actually, these are the days, these are the days when I do my infamous or maybe famous run commutes to work because honestly, I feel safer on my feet uh, than I do in my car on the roads around Reno when it snows. Now, I grew up in Southern California. 
Um, and so I really have very little interest in snow or driving in it. My wife is from Wisconsin. She's from Green Bay. So when, when it snows, I'm like, hey, how about you drive me to work? Uh, which usually is like, no, how about you put your shoes on and get yourself to work? Yeah, that's usually the, the answer, to, uh, answer to that. So, um, but I, I do love run commutes in the snow. Um, again, I just feel like I have more control over my destiny in, in, in that case. So, all right, let's move along. There's my son, Carson. Uh, we're flying down to Legoland uh, about a month ago. So this is changing how we think about weather forecasts. So you, right, you know, you, you're on social media and there's always that one model, right? That shows you the epic snowstorm. And we're like, you're just salivating over it, it coming. But every other model is showing you, yeah, not so fast. Uh, we're, 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 not, we're not looking at anything that epic or anything at all. So I love this phrase is all forecasts are wrong but some are useful. What do you think about that? I, we actually asked this on interview questions for a variety of positions in our office. And it, it people, especially folks that don't work in our office already, they're like, what? Like, how could you say that? Our forecasts are just getting better and better and better. And I'm like, okay, that's not really what I'm getting at. But um, you know, the whole thing here is that every computer model, even the one model showing the big storm that you want in seven days, it's probably going to be wrong in some respect. Timing, amounts, intensity, impacts, things like that. But can we make forecasts that are good enough for you to make a good decision? A forecast doesn't have to be perfect for you to make a good decision. Like, hey, should I travel over the summit tomorrow? Or should I get the house ready for a big windstorm tomorrow? You know, do you just, just enough data to be able to make that, that useful decision? And so that's what we're going going toward in the weather service is not trying to make, nail down the high temperature to the nearest degree. It doesn't really do anybody a lot of good, but can we make a forecast that helps you make an informed decision about what's coming in the, uh, in the future? So to do that, you know, we're providing scenarios. You know, what's that best guess forecast, which you're all used to? What's that one number? Some people still want that, and that's cool. You know, if you wanted me to tell you, hey, there's going to be two inches of snow tomorrow, hey, that's my best guess. That's cool. But hey, what's a potential worst case? You know, so I can be prepared. That national blend of models that I showed you earlier at the very beginning, all those, all those charts and graphs, that's the data that we can help provide that best guess and maybe that worst case scenario, or if you want snow, the best case. Uh, the confidence, we can, we can use our forecaster experience. So the forecaster still is part of this process. The human is still important. You may think that AI is taking over meteorology just like everything else. Yes and no, but the human is, is still a big part of it because of the experience we have working in the region. In our office in Reno, we have, we have folks that have been in the office over 20 years. They know this area backwards and forwards. And so they use that experience to help uh, brief decision makers like Caltrans and NDOT uh, on, on confidence levels. Probabilities, you know, think about what, what weather is important to you. Does it matter that there's two inches of snow or do you not care until there's a foot of snow? Then you care. Well, we can tell you, hey, what's the confidence levels in those various scenarios occurring? So let's look at the classic scenario. It's gonna go to, it's gonna snow at Tahoe this weekend. I live in the Bay Area, let's go, let's roll. And my car is not prepared in the slightest, right? So uh, the expectation, of course, of what you think you're going to get when you get there is, is that in my front yard. And I, I swear for the longest time, I said I would never be an inflatable guy, <laughs> right? I was like, I, I can't do it. And then I had kids, right? I was, we were also the people on Halloween who we, we would go into stealth mode lockdown, like darkest house possible. We're at the back of the house eating dinner like the, and I'm like, I don't want to deal with it. Well, then kids. And now we love it. Now it's our favorite. All right. There's your expectation. Here's your reality of your trip to Tahoe is that. Um, so, and then, and then there's also this, this is one of my all time favorites. So if, if you're ever looking for some, some just interesting stuff, look at the CHP, uh, the log that they have of, of events. Well, here's one where they're advising the driver is out of his truck with flip-flops refusing to chain up. So there you go. That's, you know, is that, is that not, is that not what we, maybe we call peak, uh, peak Tahoe or peak uh, Bay Area to Tahoe, right? Is uh, you got your flip-flops, you're not chaining up. Uh, there you go. All right. So here's our, that's our scenario, right? 
All right, so let's let's look at that. So let's say I tell you you ask for so that oh no don't ever tell you that that a a, um, a teeter totter isn't a good sled because at least in the backyard it is uh, probably not safe but at least in the flat backyard it, it works. All right, so my best guess is four inches of new snowfall on the pass by tomorrow morning with temps below freezing. Now for some of you that may be perfectly sufficient information to say. Oh yeah, that's no worries. On my car's ready to roll. We're we're doing this. Or if you're like me, who goes into panic mode with an inch of snow, I'm like, oh hell no, we're not doing any of that. I have no interest in that. But maybe you want some more information. Maybe you could uh, help help out. All right, there's a 95% chance of at least a dusting to two inches of snow by tomorrow morning. All right, for me personally, that's we're done. All right, I'm that that is enough. I have no interest in 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 that. But for many, oh, yeah, no worries, two inches, we're, we're good. 50% chance of four inches of snow by tomorrow morning. So there's a 50-50 chance, you know, kind of your best guess, right, right down the middle of the distribution. Now, what if I tell you, though, there's a 10% chance of 10 inches of snow on the pass tomorrow morning? So that's the thing. What is your risk tolerance? You know, if you knew this extra little nugget of information, what it, what do you do? And so that's that's something that each person has to decide for themselves. What is their what is their thresh? What is your threshold of pain when it comes to driving in 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 snow? And so this is the kind of information that we provide a lot of public safety decision makers. We're starting to roll it out more publicly via our social media and our website on um, to to show you this extra information that we now uh, can have via that national blend of of models. All right, and one last slide here before I finish up. I think it's always important to know uh, when it comes to weather forecasts, what are you going to know and when ahead of a significant storm? So, all right, here's Christmas Day. We got our Lego Santa there. Uh, and here is our snowstorm. If you like snow, you go like that. If you don't like snow, it's that. Yeah, of course. It's the week of Christmas. It's always a travel week, right? You know, travel week, so you can't you can't have dry weather on travel week, right? All right, so, you know, about two to three weeks out, we're going to start being able to tell you some general regional trends. And it might be a phrase like, it's likely to turn wet in the West towards Christmas. Probably not terribly useful to you, but it's a, it's a little bit of a, oh, okay, I might want to keep an eye on the forecast. Not, not, you know, you don't have to go into any kind of panic mode or change your airline tickets or anything like that at this point, but it's just a general situational awareness. Now, let's fast forward. Um, you know, we're not, honestly, we're not going to know a whole lot more this following week, but getting into this week, so about five to 10 days in advance, this is when we're going to start seeing a storm pattern taking shape. And we might be able to say, hey, winter storm possible Christmas travel week. This is when we're going to be looking at that national blend of models. It goes out about 10 days. We're going to start looking at that atmospheric river landfall chart, a bunch of other tools as well. So we're going to start saying, hey, keep an eye on Christmas travel week. We are seeing, we're, we're seeing that blob in the atmospheric river tool. And so keep an eye on Christmas travel week. All right, but that's about it uh, really at, at that point. And, and we're kind of you know in that phase at, the, at this point for that, that storm next week. All right, two to four days though, this is where we can start getting a little bit more confident on storm severity, character. Is it gonna be a rainmaker, a snowmaker, wind, locations affected? So in this case, we might see heavy snow pattern likely for the Sierra and Western Nevada. That's about it. We can probably provide you some very broad ranges of potential snow. It probably will still include zero, zero to X, right? It'll probably still have that. Um, but, uh, but at least we can tell you, hey, their potential is there. Now, once we get inside of one to two days, this is where we do hammer on details on timing, rain versus snow. And I think most importantly is putting the storm in a historic context. And I think it's important to say that when a storm, you know, when we look back, like, oh my God, that storm, that was this, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I've lived here 40 years and, and that's, that's important, but we're not gonna be able to tell you that really with any significant lead time. I'm not gonna be able to go in saying, okay, this is going to be a historic event uh, with any appreciable lead time. So I think that's, that's important to know. Um, but, you know, still one to two days, we're gonna say severe and prolonged travel disruptions for this year. So that should be like, you know, warnings are out, Caltrans is probably telling you to stay away, stay off the road, that, that kind of jazz um, at, at that point. So that's kind of a spectrum of predictability on your typical winter storm scenario in the, uh, in the Sierra. So that is all I got. This is a picture from White's Creek about a week ago. I was running up the trail. I was quite cold, but it, um, 
the ice formations on the creek are just were just amazing uh, seeing all that. So that's what I got. Um, I think we've got some little bit of time for any questions or comments, but appreciate your attention. Hopefully you found some nuggets out of that. So thank you. Question. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, lake effect. Yeah, yeah. So I'll kind of go. Oh, let me. Uh, oh, lake effect was the question. Let me. I'm going to see if I can go back here. Or not. Does this go back? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, here we go. Okay. There we go. All right. Lake effect snow. Um, it's actually every forecaster's nemesis because honestly, the predictability of lake effect is is hardly any. <laughs> we'll, we'll tell you when we see it. Oops. Ah, there we go. Okay, there we go. All right. So honestly, what, what happens with lake effect is you get, like in this scenario, the uh, the lake is still relatively warm. Uh, the air is, is fairly cold. And it's that temperature difference that creates what effect, effectively is little showers and thunderstorms of snow that come off the lake. And so it, it basically scoops up moisture from the lake. That's its energy source. And it creates those showers of, of likely heavy snow. And it goes, uh, you know, it, it creates a, a line of, 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 um, of heavy snow. So the one thing is it's all dependent on wind direction. So in this case, the wind is out of the north. We've actually also had lake effect events. The winds are out of the northwest or west that have absolutely buried Carson City. Carson City gets hit by lake effect snow somewhat regularly. There's been events where Carson City's gotten one to two feet of snow. Minden and the Washoe Valley, hardly anything. It's a very narrow band of, of snow. So again, it's, it's all about the temperature difference, uh, cold air, warm lake, and it's, uh, that's what feeds and, and creates those, those lake effect snow squalls. Yeah. Any question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I grew up up here, and I feel like June was one of the more miserable months <laughs> I can remember. Is that... Is that a new pattern or was that just a weird month? Like, can we expect that again? Yeah, I, you know, I, it, it, I, I, it does seem like in, in my experience here in the last, let's say 10, 15 years, that spring is more volatile than it used to be. You know, like it's, it seems like winter wants to hang on longer. Like, like in the fall, winter wants to, the dilly dally starting, but then in the spring, it hangs on a little bit longer. And so it's more volatile. So your Marches, your Aprils, your Mays, even into June, you know, we've seen events where, you'll get uh, unexpected snow. We've had, you know, I've been involved in races that have had issues in June with, with snow. I ran Broken Arrow up at, at Palisades this, uh, this June. 70% of this course was covered in snow still. I mean, it, it was an experience. I, I don't really care to repeat it, but it was an experience. Um, so yeah, I, and, and some of it too may be also psychological because by June, we're ready for summer, right? We're ready for winter to be done and for it, it to still be kind of cold and showery. It's like, oh, I'm on already enough. So it's it's a combination of both. I don't necessarily have any data to back it up that that June is is definitely getting more unsettled. Uh, we've also had Junes where it's gotten pretty hot pretty quick. So, yeah. Uh, typically, one one last thing. Typically, the big winners, like so, the 2023s, the 2017s, um, actually even like 2011, those tend to linger longer, and they, they they're big for a reason because the, the pattern just doesn't want to let go. So that's another aspect as well. So when we have a big winter, um, you can actually expect it to probably last a little bit longer into spring. Yeah. Yeah, question back there. Um, so my assumption is that when people put together those models, it's so, I don't know, like 10 they're using basically the same data to create them. Do you know enough about what they do in there to explain why you go from dark to blue to dry the same data. Sure. And so each, oh yeah, yeah, good, good, yeah, good, good point. So the question is, is about the models and in a, especially the initial conditions. Do they all use the same data that gets fed into them and then why are they different? Um, so honestly, each, each there's, there's, there's two, many ways to answer that question, but bottom line, there's, um, initial condition data, and then the model itself. How does it calculate things? How does it assume things in the atmosphere are different? So you have two major differences in, in how models are, are run. So they're all looking at the same atmosphere. It's how they assimilate the data that's different. So the European Center has a different way of assimilating all that data and, 
calibrating satellite observations versus ground observations versus weather balloons. American model has a different way of doing it. Canadian model has a different way of doing it. So that accounts for some of the variability as well. Also the model itself, like when it calculates into the future, what assumptions is it making about uh, thunderstorms and the atmosphere and the ocean? And, and um, also, you know, what, um, what resolution is it being run at? Is it being run at a high, like three kilometer horizontal resolution, or is it being run at a very coarse, like 50 kilometer uh, resolution? As much as you, you think the 50 kilometer, like why does anybody use that? Because it's not going to see anything. It, it still has value on a global scale looking at the big picture weather pattern. So it's both of those factors that can contribute to model variability between each thing. And so uh, I wish I could say like, okay, in a certain pattern, use this model. In this pattern, use this other model. It just doesn't work that way. So each, each, each model has its good days and its bad days. And so that's why we, we use that blend of models where we kind of bias correct and calibrate all of them together to come up with kind of a best guess. So, so, yeah. Um, are there, have you noticed any changes in the California current that runs on the West Coast? Did, it, did that affect mm. systems that move from West to the East? So the question is about the California current. I'll, I'll be honest, that kind of gets outside of my lane of expertise about the, the ocean currents. I, I will say that, we do monitor sea surface temperatures uh, just to read the, the tippy top of the of the ocean, just because that, that can affect weather systems as they come into the West Coast in terms of not so much the rain snow line, but more the moisture content that can be fed into storms. When the ocean is warmer, like think about the tropics where hurricanes are, you can you can ingest a lot more moisture and humidity into storms. And so then that, in theory, would feed more rainfall and snowfall into the Sierra. So when we do see those blobs of unusually warm water, remember the blob, the, the phrase people were using for the, the big anomaly off the West Coast, that didn't necessarily make storms warmer, but it made them wetter. And so that's something we definitely monitor. And those that does get fed into the computer models um, to help calculate how much we, we might get. Uh, so we definitely look at that. But in terms of changes in the California current over the, over the years, I, I can't comment on that. I just don't know. Yeah. Question from the balcony. Yes. <laughs> It seems like we have more cells, particularly rain, very isolated, very specific, and you go a couple miles and it's not raining at all. Can you comment on these very contained cells that we are experiencing? Okay, so the question is on kind of variability between precipitation cells. Is it a certain time of year or? Um... Not, not the heavy weather, but rain, rainstorms. Okay. Okay. So a lot of it is, you know, we, we will see that high variability from one location to another when the atmosphere is very unstable. So when it's more kind of thunderstorm potential, we'll see that scattered coverage where one spot will get hit really hard with heavy rainfall. And then, you know, maybe only a mile or two away, it'll be hardly um, anything. And so we, we do see that. Um, I, there hasn't necessarily been a trend uh, in, in an increase that, that we've observed, at least subjectively, in, in that um, in that pattern, but it's definitely something we can see. And we can even see it during the winter time too. We can see those, uh, those convective cells as we call them. Uh, thunder snow, you've probably all seen Jim Cantore on the Weather Channel chasing after thunder snow. We'll get that when thunderstorms come up the west side of the Sierra and then we'll get thunder snow along the, uh, the crest up in the ski areas with lightning. And that's kind of the same mechanics that are going under that. Uh, here, we'll start, oh, sorry. Uh, say that again. Windier. Mm. Also, um, on the NOAA website, the guys have taken off the mountaintop weather. So now it's kind of a windy topic. Do you know about that? Okay, so questions about wind. Um, so is it getting windier and where is our mountaintop weather webpage that we had? Uh, we just don't want you to know how windy it is. Like, it's all, and we're just keeping it, you know, it's, 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 it's government secrets, right? You know, we're, we're, we're supposed to be hiding everything. Um, no, so the mountaintop weather page, I appreciate you bringing that up. It, it is, so the, the website is largely out of our control. Uh, it's more of at a regional national headquarters level. So they've changed some things on it, but we are working to get it back on. It is actually on our to-do list and it will happen sooner rather than later because we know we have a following on the mountaintop weather page. So um, in terms of it getting windier, honestly, I haven't sensed uh, in, in terms of the data that we're looking at that it's necessarily getting windier on average, at least as I mentioned earlier, it seems like a lot of these atmospheric rivers are coming in less rain shadow than they used to be. 
and which actually would yield slightly less windy conditions. And then I'm not saying it's not windy at all, um, but that's just something that, that, that we're kind of seeing. Um, there was a, gosh, what was it? It was a couple years ago, there was a spring that was a little bit windy, windier, certainly in Reno and probably up here in Tahoe compared to normal. I forget, it might've been 2020. I remember we're getting questions about it. So, yeah, it seems like it's so windy all the time. Um, why that was, I, I couldn't necessarily explain. Um, but yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you on, on that question. I, yeah, I, I have not, in, in our operational experience, day-to-day -day weather forecast, we have not seen a, tr a decisive trend one way or the other. That's, yeah, yeah. There's a question back here. Yeah. Oh, uh, whether it's an El Nino or a week one Nino, it seems like atmospheric rivers but really like a weak uh, La Nina seems to be a condition that can generate an incredible amount of precipitation <laughs> like 2011 and just last year would that be something to forewarn in the future when we see a weak La Nina that we should either wax our sleeves or <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the question is about the weak La Nina like what's going on there why do we get so wet in the weak La Ninas and why is flood potential higher in, in those um I, it's not going to be a satisfying answer, but and I've but I've given this presentation before, and I, I I don't have a good answer for you on the why, and and neither does really anybody. Why do we? Why is our flood risk higher during those weak La Ninas? Um, I I honestly just I don't have a good answer for you, but statistically that is what that is when we, the Truckee River does see its peak flows is during those weak La Ninas. So whenever we go into what's looking like a weak La Nina winter, I always am like telling emergency managers like, okay, look, we don't know why, but get ready, you know, be a little extra prepared for flooding going into this, into this winter. Um, you know, atmospheric rivers are going to be a part of the equation, regardless of whether we're in El Nino or, or La Nina. And, and I think that's, uh, especially as the North Pacific Ocean is, is warmer than it used to be, as I referenced in a, in a question a couple of times ago, um, you know, that can scoop up more humidity and moisture. So those ARs can actually be wetter than they would have been otherwise. And so I think that's something we're seeing in the in the models and in, in the observations is when we do get these storms, they 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 feel like they're more intense. So yeah, question. Yeah, so the question is, is on, and on flooding, and this is a very true statement, a lot of flooding isn't so much on total precipitation. I mean, it can be, but a lot of it is more precipitation rate. You know, if you get a 15 minute period of five inches an hour rainfall rate, you're going to have problems, you know, with, with, with that. You know, we don't have infrastructure that's built to withstand that kind of rain rainfall rate. And have we seen an uptick in this kind of rate? And, and honestly, I think and you could say the same for tornadoes, too. Some of it, it, it can be driven by climate change. The, the atmosphere is warmer. It can hold more humidity, more moisture. And so therefore, you can expect higher intensity precipitation when when it does occur and we are seeing that the other thing is we have a better observation network out there so we're actually seeing it our radar is better at estimating precipitation we have actually a lot more sensors out there and so we're actually observing these these rates whereas you know 30 years ago we didn't necessarily have that uh quality of data to be able to do that so i think it's both factors um coming together there but you know we are seeing that and i think that's a really important point is that if you get a high burst of you know, high intensity precipitation, short burst, um, that is something that can cause impacts equal to a, a two day moderate rainfall event. So. Question, yeah. It's, it's a big difference in elevation between the local area to the, the, the summit in Reno and the Fort Leatherman summit, which rain further south. How does elevation factor into Forecast Great question. So the question is, you know, how how does elevation get factored into our weather forecasts? And and so it, it goes to the question before about model variability. You know, each model has its strengths and weaknesses. Some of our models go down to three kilometer resolution. They can resolve a lot of the peaks and valleys reasonably well, although they're still smooth. 
Um, whereas others are like at 12, 20 kilometers, which, I mean, it knows the Sierra is there, but it's kind of a, a more of a broad, smooth hump. It's not going to know about the, all the intricate little valleys here. So our official weather forecast kind of dial everything down to about a two and a half kilometer resolution. Uh, the ones from the National Weather Service. And so they they can factor in elevation down to that resolution. So your super narrow valleys, like let's say where, where Palisades is, as an example, it might just barely know that valley is there, but it's probably not going to totally, you know, the, the, the model isn't going to go totally down to where the valley floor is. So you do have to always be aware of when you look at a weather forecast is know what elevation is it representative of, and then factor, then factor it in for your specific needs. But yeah, really good question. So about for weather service, about two and a half kilometers is, is the resolution of our um, of our forecast. Yeah. Do you guys publish that when you put out a forecast? Yes. And so every like if you go to our website, so weather.gov slash reno, um, that you and you click on the map, it'll actually tell you what elevation that forecast is is valid for. Um, so that's what so it, it, it can be useful. It's like even if the forecast isn't right where you are geographically, but it's at an elevation that where you're at, it might actually be so, still somewhat useful. It might be five miles away, but it's, hey, it's at my elevation. It actually might still be representative of, of what you're looking for. Uh, yeah. I should wrap up soon, um, but I'll take a couple more questions. Yeah, go ahead. This should be a quick question. Yeah. What is, if we could have one free weather app on our phone? <laughs> <laughs> ah. Uh, if you can have one free weather app in your phone. So um, we believe it or not, we do not have an app. Uh, it's part of the National Weather Service. They're, you know, the, the private sector is taking the apps. We're not doing that. We feed a lot of the data that goes into them. Um, so honestly, I can't really recommend one. I, I actually don't use one. Um, I just look at our website and, you know, look, I just look out the window. But no, it's, it's, it's raining. So we're done. No. Um, but that it, it's a really good question though, because it each app is going to have its own algorithms and its own data sources. And so if you see wild differences between like what we're saying and what your app is saying, that's probably why and what models are using and things like that. And so some of them are, you know, trade secrets and all that jazz. Um, so just, just be mindful of that. You know, you find ones that, that, that work for you, but yeah, you had a question. Or, uh, yeah. Um, I work with a lot of longtime locals, mm -hmm. and they've been telling me nonstop that the squirrels are looking oh. fatter this week. <laughs> oh, boy. And really, what I want to ask you is, what is your honest opinion about what's going to happen this winter? This is a good wrap-up question. This is what, what is my, you're putting me on the spot, what is my best guess? Um, so honestly, about the squirrels, I'm seeing the same thing in my backyard. They're everywhere. Oh, my God. I'm like, well, of course, our fruit trees had everything on them this year. Uh, last year, we had those freezes. Remember, we had those freezes in like April and May. It killed every, all my fruit trees. And so this year, you know, everything was there. So the squirrels are eating them up. So they're nice and fat, trust me. And that's from my fruit trees. Um, all right. So my best guess for this winter, um, you know, I, I'm going to go... I'm going to go 110% of normal. So it's going to be a little above normal, but it's not going to be as haywire as last year. Re yeah, define normal. Yeah, what is normal? That's the thing. What is normal? Do we have normal anymore? I mean, our, our member, our climate does this all the time. And so is is there really, if when you average it out, is that average really meaningful when our climate goes up and down um, all the time? So yeah, no, uh, good uh, good question. Remember that even if we got half of what we got last winter, we'd still be technically above normal, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, you know, it won't, take, it won't take what we got last winter to be above normal, so. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up there. I do have to get home uh, to take care of a few things, um, but I appreciate your attention and the invitation. Thank you very much.